welcome all the delegates the participants the faculty for our second session in the airway module we will be focusing on laser surgery transoral approach as well as trans cervical approach for treating the cases of laryngotracheal stenosis linear cases it could be a combined approach as we go along we will look into all the cases different cases and how to uh, deal with them uh, i'll request uh, my fellow to welcome you all dr darshil you know i'll just uh, log in uh, a presentation and share the screen everybody are able to visualize the presentation we'll start with my first presentation in surgical options in managing the cases of bilateral immobile vocal folds i would like to uh, present welcome you all uh, this was my presentation in japan looking into the surgical options in managing the cases of bilateral immobile immobile vocal folds uh, and my uh, respect to the ishiki who had called me for his course uh, in japan i would like to also thank our head of voice clinic at dinath mangeshwar hospital and who has got us uh, with this technology uh, 25 years back and now uh, we are able to manage all these cases uh, with the help of a variety of lasers uh, in this institute and present in all the academic platforms Mr. Vasantoswal from UK. Now let's go into the pathology itself. So it's a bilateral vocal fold immobility. So vocal folds are immobile, and that's how they are obstructing the airway. So we de here define them. These are all forms of reduced or absent movements of the vocal fold. It could be because of variety of factors. bilateral abductor vocal cord palsy so mainly a neurological lesion bilateral fixation of the cricoarytenoid joint so there is nothing neurological because of internal or external trauma the cricoarytenoid joint may get fixed and cause immobility of the vocal folds or there could be laryngeal sinicky especially in the posterior glottis what are the various factors which could result in bilateral immobility the commonest being the surgical trauma during thyroidectomy which will result in neurological deficit and bilateral abductor palsy it could be malignancy of upper gastro uh, aerodigestive tract which will again involve the recurrent laryngeal nerves and give present as in mobile vocal cords or bilateral abductor palsy endotracheal intubation traumatizing 
the picoarytenoid joint and causing fixation or resulting into the syneche varical various neurological diseases causes some central neurological causes as well external neck trauma or many of the cases we don't find any of these factors and we can term them as idiopathic or maybe because of viral etiology or viral infections in children we should always look into central neurological causes because these are the most frequent etiological factors to cause bilateral abductor palsy in pediatric age group as far as neurological lesions are concerned its reduced or absent function of the vagus nerve or its distal branch the recurrent laryngeal nerve how we see or how these cases present with the first episode of bilateral vocal fold palsy dysphonia the patients would come as dysphonia as vocal cords are actually in abducted position so they are two apart they are in the cadaveric position and over time they migrate to the midline basically to start with they are both apart in the cadaveric position and as the time progresses they would move medially and cause airway obstruction so to start with it would be dysphonia breathiness in the voice with aspiration which would produce or which would progress into breathlessness but good voice because the vocal cords are in the midline or close to each other so the voice would be better but patient would have breathlessness there are some conditions that could mimic bilateral vocal fold palsy so it could be paradoxical vocal fold motion or we can term them as functional glottic obstruction uh i mean as you see or do endoscopy of these patients these are generally young patients when you do the endoscopy they will come with breathlessness not really a stride or but breathlessness and when you look into their larynx with the endoscope you will find bilateral abductor palsy so really the vocal cords are in the midline but when you start measuring their oxygen concentration it really is above 95% so they would never go into the strider as such so you can term them as functional glottic obstruction how to manage these cases neurological opinion basically counseling of the patient and the parents because usually the parents are usually at uh, anis to reduce the stress you can start with beta blockers if the patient comes uh, maybe three four times and maybe again every two months every three months in your casualty and present as breathlessness then you can try with local uh, botulinum if suppose this attacks continue you may have to go in for partial uh, arrhythmic therapy what are the investigations basically for these cases first thing imaging the x ray the ct scan the virtual endoscopy you have to rule out any other cause of breathlessness especially in the other part of the uh, airway like uh, in the trachea in the bronchi or maybe sometimes in the chest you will also rule out any primary lesion in the chest especially at uh, mediastinum or in the neck which is causing uh, pressure or maybe dysfunction of the recurrent laryngeal nerve endoscopic examination is the key flexible laryngoscopy has to be done which would give you good idea about the pathology video laryngostroboscopy would give uh, differentiate 
whether it is a fixed chord or a paralyzed chord that we are going to see in further slides. Electromyography. Really, when the patient comes immediately following thyroidectomy, then whether these nerves are not functioning because of edema or because of trauma or because of section, that you may be able to know with the potentials in the vocalis muscle. So, EMG may help to check if there is going to be any chance of recovery and avoid any surgery or tracheostomy for these patients. But still it is in experimental stages and not as a routine in all the clinics. Endoscopic examination, you have to check the mucosal wave again to differentiate a fixed cord. Fixed cord would not produce any mucosal waves. But the case of neurological lesion, the cords are in the midline, they are immobile, but they will have a good mucosal waves. So that's how you differentiate between a fixed vocal cord and a paralyzed vocal cord. You have to also rule out cases of tracheoesophageal fistula and any concurrent lesions in the airway. Now, when the patient comes with the sole lesion of glottic obstruction because of immobile vocal folds, what are the aims of the treatment? Basically, to give them the safe and adequate airway. Preservation of voice quality, because if you have to dissect part of the vocal cord, then how would be the phonetary outcome after the surgery? So there are some tricks which are, we are going to discuss further. So voice air quality and of course why we say safe airway because the airway should be safe in the sense it should prevent aspiration. So you should have good laryngeal competence for complete swallowing and it should prevent any kind of aspiration after the surgery. We are going to see all these things as we go ahead with the slides. Now, what could be the non-surgical methods uh, um, uh, management uh, options for uh, these cases? Non-surgical like iatrogenic idiopathic, uh, you can wait for uh, up to nine months with the help of steroids, nebulization, um, and wait and watch policy. Surgical would be first and foremost give the adequate airway so to, you can do a tracheostomy. If you want to avoid tracheostomy, then there are various transoral endoscopic approaches you can use. The foremost is transoral endoscopic laser cordectomy, cordotomy, arytenectomy. There are variety of ways in which how much you have open up the airway. You can lateralize the vocal fold and produce and give adequate airway. It could be again temporary or permanent. If you foresee any improvement, you can do a temporary. If not, you can do permanent, which you're going to see in the further slides. If there is a web or senity in the posterior cortex, you can just excise them and then uh, maybe uh, to prevent re or refibrosis you can put in some soft tissue there, like some muscle or a cricopharyngeal mucosa. You can do laryngo fissure. In the posterior glottis, you can put in a muscle flap with lateralization of the vocal folds. A uh, new thing which is coming up or has been tried is re innervation and laryngeal pressing, but still in the experimental phases. Now, what we follow? And in most of the institutes, which gives adequate airway, good phonetry outcome, and prevents any kind of aspiration, 
is transoral laser chorodectomy with partial arytenectomy. We are going to see the clips and how we perform this procedure. I'm glad to note uh, Mr. Vasant Oswal, my boss, uh, has merited the explanation, the steps for these clips. So basically, here is the area when you start your surgery with. So position the scope in that area of excision of the uh, larynx. Let's see it again. So this is just anterior to the vocal process, in which that means you are including the posterior one third of the vocal cord. So the incision mark should be anterior to the vocal process. Then you can go laterally and include part of the vocal fold, uh, for part of the ventricular band, and part of the medial, uh, part of the arytenoid cartilage. And this kind of incision you can take. So exposure should be good enough. This is the acute blade of the CO2 laser. The first thing is doing a chorodotomy. Uh, you mark the uh, incision line. So as I explained, anterior to the vocal process, to vocal cord, the false vocal cord. And part of the arytenoid. We start with HDL. Excision. This is for the Tommy. I have taken the incision here. This is HFJV, the cannula, which is ventilating the patient. High frequency jet ventilation. To protect the posterior commissure.
is pre-operative and this is post-operative. Because of the elastic forces in the cord, the anterior tooth is, is retracted anteriorly and after the surgery you feel the opening is too much and then we are going to see in further post-operative clips how much we are going to get with this type of surgery. To prevent when you are vaporizing or when you are doing any trauma with the forceps or with the laser uh, to the perichondrium, there are granulations which are going to come up. To prevent those coming up, you can apply fibrin glue there locally or you can also use mitomycin C to prevent the fibrosis. You can check the glottic aperture, how much you have got by passing in the endotracheal tube of numbers many size six and then if you are able to pass it without any force then you have achieved adequate uh, glottic opening suture lateralization this is a case of bilateral aperture palsy now uh, we are planning to do permanent lateralization to do a permanent lateralization it would not be sufficient to take a suture and lateralize the cord because as soon as you remove the suture, the cord would again be in the midline. To prevent this, to make it permanent, what we do, we vaporize the vocalis muscle and make a raw area lateral to the edge of the vocal fold. Over that, we pass in the suture with the help of Lichtenberger needle and lateralize the vocal fold. This is how the picture is after lateralization of the vocal cord and then we take the sutures outside into the neck. This is the picture six months after the surgery and this is the airway you achieve with the help of suture lateralization. So as you see, there is an adequate and good airway but maybe there would be little hoarseness uh, with the suture lateralization method. With the uh, cordectomy, we are going to see in the further clips. Now, these are cyanity, fibrous bands in the posterior glottis. So this is a case of immobile vocal cord because of this cyanity. Now what I'm going to see is not only the cynity or mobility of the vocal cords, but how is the mobility of the arytenoids? That is very important. And as you see, the arytenoids are quite mobile. So precorrected joints are not involved. What you can do, check the cynity here if they are complete or incomplete in the sense, are they involving the posterior commissure as well? This band was not involving the posterior commissure. So what I did, this is uh, the anesthetic bougie, which I have passed in the posterior commissure, which was free of any sanity or any fibrosis. And then with the help of laser, I excised the band. So there was no trauma or no uh, vaporization in the posterior commissure or in the intraarytenoid area. And because the vocal cords were mobile, because we have seen preoperatively, the movement of the arytenoids was quite visualized and this is the post-operative result. So just cutting in the band, we are able to give good airway for this patient. This is a complete posterior rotic web in which the arytenoids are not mobile. Then you can vaporize, do a cordectomy, uh, and just to avoid refibrosis, you can pass in the posterior mucosal flap, the cricopharyngeal flap here to avoid refibrosis in this area. This is after the surgery. Uh, uh, uh. We 
in pediatric age group not to be aggressive in exercising the part of the vocal cord or the arytenoids because coronary outcome is very much important for their life absolutely for a long period of time uh, children may go in for aspiration uh, immediately after the surgery we have to check for it and if required you can have to pass a nasogastric tube for 7 days because you are exercising or cutting the part of the arytenoid as well so they may land into aspiration especially children proper selection there are i mean various things have been tried retri innervation you have to rule out associated laryngomalacia or laryngotracheomalacia in these children this is partial uh, arytenoidectomy in a child which has presented with bilateral aortic palsy and this is post operative picture with uh, adequate airway to prevent uh, i mean uh, any hoarseness after the surgery if you want to preserve the vocal cord structure then there are various methods uh, which has been described and uh, i told director has described this procedure in which this is expansion laryngoplasty so we have to take incisions in the anterior trichoid uh, anterior part of the trichoid and inter arytenoid area dilate it with balloon so cricopharyngeal expansion uh, so sorry trichoid expansion and then passing the endotracheal tube and keep the child in icu for about 3 weeks in the meanwhile the wound will heal and child would have adequate airway but there are technical difficulties like keeping in the child for 3 weeks intubated in the icu uh, to prevent any accidental decannulation and about again a cost factor uh now functional outcome in the sense the airway and the voice and swallowing so as far as coronary outcome is concerned uh, i have uh, some follow up of the patient so this patient who had uh, presented with bilateral aortic palsy these are recordings on high speed camera so bilateral aortic palsy mucosal waves are present this is one week post surgery so there is edema of the vocal cord you can see but adequate airway but there is going to be healing and then the same patient we followed up and we got some clips after 6 months so now this is the airway which is there but you see the airway is adequate you see the mucosal waves so this is in section and this is in adduction in the mucosal waves quite good this would give a good coronary outcome for the patients and good airway as well Uh, I mean, uh, post-thyroidectomy, the sensory recovery uh, would take around three months. Because patients would have uh, aspiration to start with when they present with uh, neurological trauma or neurological cause. Uh, the sensory recovery takes place in about three months. Till that time, you can start right through or neurological feeding. now this is one of my case actually which i have done uh, orotectomy and partial arytenectomy so you can see the airway is quite adequate but uh, there is a non clinical aspiration which uh, we were able to decide because of the frequent cough and all these things and uh, uh, i tried to find out are there any ways surgical methods Uh, to correct this aspiration and uh, i i don't know maybe my colleagues are here no call and 
from UK. And as far as I know, there are no surgical corrections possible for persisting aspiration. So when you are doing polytomy and arytenectomy, don't do it um, in one session. Don't try to give uh, wide airway because that would result in post-operative aspiration is very difficult to correct. Apart from aspiration, as we have already seen, you have to protect the interarytenoid area during the surgery because if you do trauma to this mucosa in between the arytenoids, then there could be interarytenoid fixation. Again, very difficult to treat these cases. Patients can have granuloma as big as this, and um, this could be, uh, this can be, this is due to uh, trauma to the cartilage and uh, perichondrium. So you have to do endoscopy. You have granuloma, you can just remove the granuloma and inject steroids uh, for the surgery to prevent the occurrence. Uh, how much airway the patient would give require for his normal day-to-day -day activities? Uh, the airway actually this is after post polytomy this is up to 6 to 8 millimeters so that is how you can check with the uh, endotracheal tube after the surgery and after the endoscopy uh, with the airway which a patient any adult patient would require for his day to day uh, activities whether to go in for polytomy only or arytenoidectomy then interarytenoid distance, if it is more than two, say, two millimeters, it is more than two millimeters, then you can do polytomy only. If it is less than two millimeters, then polytomy with arytenectomy. This is a rough guide. Uh, again, balloon dilatation for uh, posterior aortic stenosis or uh, bands and post surgery. Now, the balloons which are available, they are a round shape, balloon shape, and they are not able to really fix, get fixed into the posterior glottis because it's a square one. So, you have to use some tricks like pass some bougie or uh, suction in the cannula in the anterior glottis, then the balloon would dilate the posterior glottis uh, only. I'll show you uh, figures. So what's the future? Um, I mean, laryngeal pacing seems to be a, one of the uh, technology which could uh, avoid all types of surgical methods and give good monetary outcome uh, apart from re innovation which again is trial and now mainly done for unilateral local cord palsy, but there are centers which are still trying it for cases of bilateral abdominal palsy. These are the presentations which I have used for practice and surgery. Thank you very much for your patient listening and then we'll go on to the question answer session after we finish with uh, talks from my esteemed faculty members. Thank you so much, Sachin Gandhi, sir. Uh, we move on to uh, next uh, to our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Chadwan Al uh, Yakchi from London, United Kingdom. He is a consultant e ENT surgeon with a subspecialist interest in adult and pediatric laryngology, uh, and he is currently based at National Center for Airway Reconstruction and Imperial College Laryngology Service, Charing Cross Hospital, NHS Trust. Uh, he has a special interest in transgender healthcare and has developed a number of voice feminization procedures. And this includes uh, his own modification to the Wendler's glottoplasty technique, which has since become the preferred method for voice feminization. He uh, is a founding member of International Association of Trans Voice Surgeons, British Laryngology Association, Vice President of Royal Society of Medicine, Medicine Section of Laryngology and Rhinology, and board member of UK Swallowing and Research Group. Apart from laryngology, he holds a PhD in molecular oncology 
and has special interest in um, oncolytic viruses uh, affecting head and neck uh, diseases. We welcome, welcome you, sir. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you very much for having me. So I'm just going to share my slides. I hope you can see my slides well. So, um, thank, once again, thank you for the introduction. I work in the National Center for Airway Reconstruction in London Imperial College Hospital. And the first thing I wanna say about managing laryngotracheal stenosis, that this is a team sport. You need that large team around you. You need your surgeons, but also you need your speech and language therapy, your clinical nurse specialist, your admin support and your allied health professionals from dietitian to nutrition nurse and allied specialty that you work closely with, gastroenterology and respiratory. The patient has complex need and you often need to address multi-factors affecting the patient at the same time. So adult laryngotracheal stenosis, it's a very heterogeneous disease process. The patient varies significantly in terms of age, clinical presentation, comorbidity, etiology, site of the disease, and their baseline function. And you need to tailor your approach to each individual patient based on all of these complex factors. So, so far in our center, we managed, we are just over 1000 cases of airway stenosis. As you can see, this is the breakdown. So 40% of our workload is acquired laryngotracheal stenosis. This is post-intensive care admission. And the numbers were high initially, dropped down as care in intensive care improved. But over the last couple of years, we saw a huge resurgence of this with the COVID pandemic. Second most common we see is bilateral vocal cord mobility, followed by idiopathic subglottic stenosis, granulomatosis with polyangitis, which what used to be called Wegener's uh, vasculitis, uh, supraglottic stenosis and so on, a number, a wide range of more rare conditions. So post ICU airway stenosis, so I, I thought to start this talk, I will talk about the three most common condition that we face, and then I will talk about our approach to management. So if you look into patient who's been intubated in intensive care straight after extubation, if you look at their airway, almost half of these patients will have evidence of airway injury. You will see that inflammation, you will see granulation tissue, you will see mucosal damage. However, most of these will recover and they will recover without any intervention. The risk of long-term stenosis with prolonged intubation is around is less than 5%. And there are various factors that determine why some patients go into stenosis while the majority will heal well. We know from our research, from our work in, in our center that early intervention improves outcome. So if you see patients early on um, having some stridor post-extubation, you look and there is a lot of granulation tissue, then try to intervene early. So if you, when you have that inflammatory phase of injury, you can treat it with gentle dilation, gentle approach, inject steroid, resect any dead tissue, you nurse that mucosa to health and you prevent the patient developing this thick mature scar that becomes a lifelong condition. And there are plenty of risk factors that determine the patient direction. So one of the most important one is the size of the um, endotracheal tube. So endotracheal tube, the size of the trachea is proportional to the, per to the patient height. So a very short man will have potentially a smaller trachea compared to a long, a tall woman. And you need to keep that in mind when you're deciding what tube you wanna use. When I, when I was first a trainee, we used to see like frequently size nine tubes being used. And this practice in the UK at least has almost completely gone. There has been a huge drive within the intervention care community, working with ENT, difficult airway society, tracheostomy, uh, international tracheostomy collaborative to improve the standards of care within intensive care around intubation, around airway safety. 
And that leads to recognition and the re reduction of the size of the tubes that been used. Continuous monitoring of the cuff pressure is extremely important because one of the main risk factor is cuff pressure, too high cuff pressure, patient agitation. If the patient is not well sedated and you have that tube into the airway and with the balloon inflated, you get that shear forces uh, on the mucosa leading to mucosal laceration and mucosal damage. Reflux is an important factor. So you, I'm sure. Their vocal, some stomach content, some saliva, and it is important mouth hygiene and I think I lost connection. Can you can you hear me and see me? Yes, yes, we can, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, fine. Let me go back to share my slide. Apologies for this. So, how about tracheostomy? Sir, I think there's some uh, network issue. We are not able to hear you, and even your video has been frozen. Hello? Hello? Can you, can you hear me? Uh, Dr. Chadwa, can you yeah. hear me? I can hear you now. Can yeah, you hear we me? We can hear you now. Yeah. We can hear you, but uh, there is some uh, disturbance. I mean, uh... yeah, the internet, my internet is good. I'm not sure what's going on. Let mm -hmm. me, let me try again. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can hear you quite well. Now we can hear you. Okay, let me try again. So I was saying that normally, if, you if we have a patient think that they will be intubated over a week, however, tracheostomy itself is associated with airway stenosis. Um, Oh. Let me try once again. Um, Hello. Uh, Hello, Paul. Uh, can you, uh, Paul? Yes. 
Hello, Paul. Paul, good morning. Paul, are you able to hear me? Paul. Uh, Dinesh. Now, the Paul selection for them. Okay, uh, I think uh, we'll take a break for uh, after uh, Yakshi's talk. We'll go back to him and we'll start with uh, Paul Castellan's lecture. Paul, can you unmute yourself? Yes, sir. Hello. Um, I tried to change location at home. Uh, can you go to Paul Castellos? Is there a step? Can you hear me better now? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, we, we are able to. Okay. Um, I just moved around, moved from the office elsewhere. To let me see if this is any better. I do apologize for this. Now seems good, sir. Other audio. Okay. Yeah. Fine, let me try. So, going back to tracheostomy, tracheostomy itself is associated with tracheal, tracheal stenosis. So you can see damage from the trachea tube to the uh, anterior trachea ring can, can lead to collapsing of the trachea ring. So you lose that arc support of the trachea and the patient end up with what we call an A-frame deformity. And I'll just show you an example of a patient from uh, this is post-COVID patient who have a trachea. And you can see the severe stenosis at the level of the tracheostomy. So this is a collapse of the tracheal wall. And here with a four millimeter scope, I'm trying to pass through. And it is quite a struggle. It's a tight fit. And you can see if you can compare that to the diameter of the normal airway. So I think now nowadays we see a lot of patient post intensive care. So patient comes have a uh, after intensive care, we're seeing a lot more patients since the COVID pandemic. And the A-frame deformity is quite common. I, I would go as far as like almost every patient after a tracheostomy will have that. But the vast majority will be mild and does not cause any difficulties. Bilateral vocal cord mobility. Um, Dr. Gandhi covered that in detail. So it's pretty much the same approach. Just want to highlight a couple of things. So um, we look into, this is the area that's grade three when you have that inflammatory process, address it early before it develops into that posterior glottic scar, which becomes a lifelong condition that needs management. And finally, the last condition I want to talk about is idiopathic subglottic stenosis. So this is, possibly a lot more relevant in, um, in Northern Europe, Australia, and North America. It's a condition that affects only female and only Caucasian female of North, North European heritage. Um, so, we'll see, so we will see this stenosis at the lower edge of the cricoid cartilage and the top of the first trachea ring. That's where it classically presents. If you look into histology, you take biopsy, it have this bland scar tissue. There is no granulation, no vasculitis, chronic inflammation only. And there are various different theories of why this happens. So different research group around the world working on this. There is a lot of research going into this condition. So we, there are role of human um, hormonal receptors, the role of fibroblasts and maturation of fibroblasts and the subclass of fibroblasts that can be involved and engaged in this healing process. There is genetic predisposition and there is looking into environmental factors. So one of the theories, most widely accepted theories that there is a genetic predisposition and you need an, envir an environmental trigger that to kick off this process. And it's a chronic condition that recur frequently. So when we think about how we manage airway stenosis, there are generally two approaches, endoscopic approach or open approach. An endoscopic approach is by far is the workhorse of what we do. So in any normal week in our center, we will do 
10 to 15 endoscopic dilation of the airway, laser, etc., with all the modification, while we do an open airway procedure almost every other week. So 20, 25 procedures a year compared to almost 500 in the endoscopic approaches. But we developed in our center, my colleague, Professor Sandu, developed um, endoscopic laryngotracheal reconstruction, and we'll talk about in a second. The open approaches generally are laryngotracheal reconstruction with posterior um, cricoid enhancement, cricotracheal resection, and a trachea resection. So you will have two approaches to the airway. You either need to enhance the airway, make it wider, augment it, or you need to resect that area that is stenosed and do end-to-end -end anastomosis. This is the general principle. So I thought I would just show you quickly how we do our endoscopic dilation. So this is for an idiopathic or any vasculitis, post-intubation, subglottic stenosis. So you can see we do these cases with high-frequency jet, supraglottic jet, no tube in the airway, and we start first by injecting longer acting steroids. So we use uh, tramcinolone or metallic right. head. We make laser cuts, so I like to do like a Mercedes star. So I do three laser cuts. I go through all the scar tissue before yeah. I do my balloon dilation. So that is like a releasing incision and prevent tearing the mucosa and tearing of the tracheal wound. And we dilate up to 16 and a half millimeter. And then that's what it looks like. It doesn't look great at the beginning, but it heals very well. And the patient immediately get that improvement in symptoms. So this is the standard operation. This is what we do day in, day out. Laser arytenoidectomy. So for bilateral vocal cord immobility, we like to do posterior laser arytenoidectomy. So my, my approach is slightly different from the approach you heard from Dr. Gandhi. And as, as you heard, there are so many approaches that being described. There are pros and cons to each. And you need to tailor that approach again to the patient based on the patient baseline function and um, their presentation. One point to highlight is this is airflow dynamic from our group in Imperial College. Um, and then you can see the vast majority of the airflow. So this is the glottis front to back. The vast majority happens in the posterior one third. So again here, a couple of millimeter, all you need is five to six millimeter in the posterior glottis to give the patient normal day-to-day -day function. So moving on to endoscopic laryngotracheal reconstruction or the MADEN procedure named after Janet Madden, who the first patient that went underwent this operation. So this procedure described by my colleague, Professor Guri Sandhu, and it's mostly for management of idiopathic subglottic stenosis. Although when recently we started to progressing the indication, we can use it rarely with vasculitis, but you need to have a patient completely quiescent disease, completely controlled, no flare up for many years or select patient with post intubation. The idea is, you make, you make your laser cut to gauge your depth, but because with idiopathic subglottic stenosis, this is a submucosal disease. The cartilage, the structure of the larynx of the trachea are intact. So you need to remove all of that disease. So once we gauge our depth, we go with a micro debrider and we remove all of that scar tissue. But then if you leave it that way, it's gonna scar. If you do circumferential injury into the airway, it's gonna scar and you simply gonna make matters worse. So what we use, we take an open-ended stent, we take a split thickness skin graft from the leg and we wrap that skin graft around the stent. And then we place that stent endoscopically in place. So you can see here is the Montgomery T-tube. We cut part of the vertical limb uh, to create that stent. You will see here the skin graft is around it and we fix it with a suture through the neck, so without opening the neck. So those, all of that is endoscopic, just with a transcutaneous stent, and we leave this in place for two weeks. And you come back after two weeks, it's, you know, you'll have some biofiling over, but you remove it, and you can see this islands of keratinocyte and skin taken into the areas that we, you exposed previously. And that's in itself. So the keratinocyte, the idea here that there is interaction between the keratinocyte and the fibroblast leading to suppression of fibrosis. But skin have downside, having a skin into the airway definitely have its downside, mostly the keratin and mucus getting stuck, leading to the patient coughing, requiring sometimes multiple intervention. Mm. So we go back a couple of weeks later, four to six weeks, and we laser ablate some of that skin because it has served the purpose. So we do superficial laser ablation, and then you come back a few weeks later and you, you release anything that left behind. 
and it has good succession rate in terms of um, preventing recurrence, although you need to warn the patient beforehand about the risk of having mucus constantly, that mucus issue. The open procedure we do, so this is laryngotracheal reconstruction, this we do for mostly when you have posterior glottic stenosis. From experience, doing laser arytenoidectomy is good for temporizing measure, but if you have that posterior glottic scar, then you will need something else. You need to augment that area. And that's what we do. So you can see this is uh, this is the larynx, that's endoscopic approach. We go with the open neck. We do laryngo fissure from the front. We split the cricoid anteriorly and posteriorly. And then we take a rib cartilage and we shape it into this T-shaped spacer pretty much. And you place that in the posterior cricoid. And then we put a skin covered uh, stent on top. And we leave it again similarly for a couple of weeks. You come back and you take it and you see some skin covering the area and you have a much wider glottis. And that that's majority of the time will, will buy you, um, the patient, good enough airway for them to resume back to life and for decannulation. The success rate, the two risk factor that determines success with this operation is a BMI and aspiration. So a patient with a BMI over 34 the success rate drops significantly. Ideally, you want patient with BMI under 30. We push it and our cutoff is 34. Any patient over that, they will need to lose significant weight before we do this because otherwise it's gonna fail. The second risk factor is aspiration. So we have always, we assess the swallowing, we do instrumental swallowing assessment. We have early intervention in terms of swallowing rehabilitation to improve our chances of success. Cricotracheal resection, this is an operation we don't do a lot in our center. This is the main application of this operation is for idiopathic subglottic stenosis. And we generally feel that resecting normal healthy tissue leading to voice deepening in these ladies affected by this condition is possibly not the right approach to. Some other people in other center believe the success rate is really high in terms of recurrence. However, the functional outcomes, especially voice, are not great. However, we utilize this when you have something either damage specific to the cricoid, traumatic injury, or if you have thyroid cartilage invasion um, or other tracheal malignancy that affected the cricoid cartilage. And finally, tracheal resection. This is the mainstay treatment for A-frame deformity. If you have the cartilage collapse, if the framework of the trachea has collapsed, endoscopic approaches, rarely successful. You can temporize med, use it as a temporizing measure. If you have somebody who is really unfit for a general anesthetic, you can try to prevent the trachea by doing laser. But if you want good functional outcome, these patients will, will need trachea resection if the length of the stenosis allows that. And here is on the simpler end of what we do in terms of airway. So you need to resect that and you need to do end-to-end -end anastomosis, needs meticulous closure, attention to details to prevent the patient from forming scar at the stenosis site. And we do most of these nowadays. We don't put a tracheostomy, we do it as with an LMA, we do end-to-end -end anastomosis and we wake the patient up without the trachea and they go home a few days later with a good success and long-term results. And on that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Am I able to be heard? Hi, hi, Paul. Hey, good to see you. How are you? I haven't seen you for many years. Yes, hi, yes, Paul. very fine. Um, there are, uh, are several publications, and um, uh, I share the uh, approach that has been described to preserve the female voice in patients undergoing cricotracheal resection, it really does work if you yeah. advance um, some of the trachea without its cartilage. So you literally take a short strut of cartilage out of the front and then lay the, the muscle flap of the tissue that had the, um, the origins of the cricothyroid muscle within it, uh, assuming it hasn't been destroyed by the corrosive process. It really does work. The pitch is, is definitely higher and they can modulate the pitch with that tissue. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I know this is becoming more widely um, popular approach. So I, I know various different centers in the state 
including yourself, do that approach. We personally, I don't have a lot of experience in that, mostly because we we favor the madam procedure. So, and we, in generally, our approach to idiopathic subglottic stenosis that if the patient needs dilation every 12 to 18 months, we don't do anything else. We'll bring them once a year, we dilate them and they go and we'll give them good function. So very few end up needing reconstruction in our center, but it's definitely an approach that is, you can utilize to preserve the voice in these patients. Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, Dr. Gandhi here, yeah. yeah. We'll come back to question and answer session. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Paul, welcome. It will be too early in the morning for you. Thank you very much for uh, coming again. And we wait yeah. to hear from you. So for all our viewers, uh, let me introduce Dr. Paul Castellanos. As such, he requires no introduction. But uh, let me just uh, read out a few lines uh, for him. Uh, he is a senior consultant at uh, St. Mercy Hospital, Ohio, USA. Prior to that, uh, he was, for more than a decade, he was the director at uh, UAB Voice and Aerodigestive Center, University of Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, uh, United States of America. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Yes, it's my pleasure. Um, let me share my screen and... Um, uh, this presentation and we'll start my slideshow here. Um, I'll be talking about a topic that um, many of you heard me speak on in various facets, uh, reconstructive transoral laser microsurgery, but for two specific um, indications, uh, time permitting. Uh, one of them is the uh, incidence of um, uh, pseudo airway obstruction, pseudo bilateral vocal fold paralysis, um, um, and the other is of uh, posterior um, cricoarytenoid joint fixation in the form of a posterior glottic web. Those two are very important issues, and they were mentioned by our last speaker. But I have a um, uh, a um, contrary vision of what needs to be done. The entirety of the scar needs to be removed and fresh tissue needs to be put into place. Otherwise you have fixed cricoretinoid joints that are now just separated some distance apart. Um, let me see if I can improve my lighting a little bit. Perhaps that's better. Um, the sphere of uh, reconstructive transoral laser microsurgery is actually quite huge there are more things that I can do transorally now and do routinely transorally uh, that were entirely open uh, procedures when I was in training, uh, that it's, um, it's nothing short of amazing. The one thing I can't yet do is uh, to do a transoral tracheal segmental resection, uh, but uh, believe it or not, I, I believe robotics will, um, uh, will change that. Eventually, we'll be doing transoral tracheal resections and just feeding the trachea uh, like a telescoped uh, uh, reconstruction from the distal place after you've removed the disease tissue and then hoist it up to the proximal trachea to get um, a union. Um, but I uh, point to this um, uh, designation here, bilateral vocal fold paralysis. Uh, in my experience, uh, easily three out of, of uh, five, maybe four out of five of the patients that are referred to me for this condition, in fact, have unilateral vocal fold paralysis with encroachment. That is to say the paralyzed cord where, where it was moving into the midline, maybe the patient several years prior had a voice that they thought, hmm, that's not such a bad voice, but eventually started becoming short of breath as that cord moved past the midline and now looks something like a crooked cord with the arytenoid over adducted hitting the opposite side. So when the uh, otolaryngologist looks at the airway, he sees two cords that appear not to be able to move apart. And hence they think, oh, tracheostomy is needed. This patient's got vocal fold paralysis bilaterally, where in fact one cord is normal. I keep encountering colleagues who say, I don't see this disease. Well, they see bilateral paralysis. And I can assure you, you need to rule this out in those patients. This is something that needs to be established definitively before you proceed with, with doing bilateral cordotomies or cordectomies or retinoidectomies. 
my goodness, you can destroy an awful lot of tissue instead of taking care of it. So I'll just briefly run through the technology and the um, instruments. Um, I don't have a, a timer in front of me. If um, you have such a tool on Zoom, I'd be grateful just to uh, give me some uh, time markers. Um, I can keep track of my own uh, clock. Um, uh, the time I was given seemed like an inordinately long time. Uh, it was 90 minutes. Is that possible? I, I mean, I'm ready to speak for however long you need me to, nonetheless. Um, so everyone knows laser modes. Uh, we've long since left continuous wave uh, CO2 lasers, but in fact, we're using many continuous wave lasers uh, in the form of diode lasers um, or um, uh, YAG lasers, for example, that are not in pulse mode. Uh, Continuous wave lasing, that concept is one that uh, uh, almost, regardless of the wavelength, will destroy more tissue, produce more thermal injury, and cause more inadvertent scarring. So think of super pulse lasing, at least pulse lasing, and then ultra pulse lasing is, um, is truly the, um, the gold standard for the cleanest, most atraumatic cutting with reasonable degrees of uh, hemolysis. Scanning lasers are also uh, now available from uh, multiple vendors, uh, and they are also extremely useful because they move the spot of the laser to prevent past pointing of your laser energy. Here's one such uh, scanning system. So wide mouth access is key for transoral surgery. Uh, the, the wider, the better. If you can get uh, uh, a scope this size, this is the Lindholm into the pharynx, um, or a distending scope, you will be able to work much more uh, comfortably in the uh, distal airway. Here are some other versions that, uh, that can be used, and uh, the Steiner versions that have uh, uh, very vigorous evacuation of the plume. That's key for a healthy tissue recovery. This is the Hini, which I think is an excellent scope. Uh, it doesn't always fit in the mouth and, and uh, superglottis of uh, some patients, but when it does, it is uh, extraordinarily uh, useful. Uh, and the setup is uh, uh, extensive, if not cumbersome. Uh, here's Dr. MK um, during his fellowship uh, uh, doing a reconstruction of the um, posterior glottic web. Grasping instruments that have uh, suction potential are also really key. and um, uh, soft tissue manipulation with alligator forceps and, and soft tissue rearrangement with alligator forceps are also key. I think many of you have heard me make the point that the clip appliers are great for vascular control, but they're also great for securing sutures. Um, this is an example of a patient with a supraglottic carcinoma that uh, uh, was post-radiation therapy, so there was very little that could reasonably be done, be done open because it would not have healed. Uh, I took him to the operating room to do uh, a uh, sufficient excision and turned up having to do a uh, near complete supraglottectomy. Uh, the cancer was extensive. It was uh, penetrating the preapoglottic space. Um, and this was the specimen. It, it looks like a complete clostectomy, doesn't it? Um, but in the uh, context of uh, this operation, uh, you could see the resection bed. Um, here's the two sides of the thyroid lamina. These are the strap muscles up here. Um, the uh, piriform sinuses are largely removed except posteriorly. And these clips are all on branches of the superior laryngeal artery. Um, it was in this context that it occurred to me that you could use clips and not worry about whether or not they might fall off into the airway because it, it matters not. This is titanium, it's completely inert and uh, biocompatible. So from that point on, the clip appliers became the way I attached and controlled sutures within the larynx and pharynx, and I have never looked back. Um, the uh, technique has uh, uh, basically no complication rate and no failure rate. It holds your suture just like it holds a blood vessel. And uh, anyone that uh, has done a lot of knot tying in a laryngoscope knows uh, what, uh, what 
horrors you're being saved by not having to do this. This is a good way to practice the technique between two uh, rubber tubes so that it's under tension. Then you clip it and you can see as your suture holding as the, the uh, fourth panel shows. And this is, of course, an artist rending of that technique. Uh, in up close and personal, this um, this is uh, in the, the in the advancement flap. This is the post cricoid flap. This is my alternative to that uh, um, operation where you place a cartilage graft between the two sides of the uh, cricoid that you just split. Um, the reason this is advantageous is because it it is predicated on mobilizing the arytenoid. That is a key thing that has to occur for a posterior glottic web to be uh, um, removed and a working larynx to be restored. Um, if all you do is spread the two frozen arytenoids apart, all you will ever have is an open glottis and a very poor voice. Um, I think uh, we can agree if you, if you do not reestablish movement, you will not get a good voice. So you get a good voice by mobilizing the arytenoids and you separate the arytenoids by removing all the scar and bringing fresh tissue between the cords. So this, this suture now has been passed through the uh, flap and then passed anteriorly um, and, and is now being drawn uh, into the wound again. I, do, I almost always do double passes to get twice the amount of tissue brought together with half the tension. That's the, a pulley concept, and it's a, a tried and true concept in uh, uh, in engineering. And by the way, we are soft tissue engineers, or even soft tissue physicists sometimes, as we try to figure out what's the matter with with an airway. So you can see alligator forceps, not needle driver forceps, are used, and the curved alligators are ergonomically. Uh, uh, well designed to be able to hold a needle and then you anchor it in some tissue then you point the tip and get it through the two sides of the wound I'll jump ahead a little bit so you can see this in place and then as you pull on the two free ends of the suture you can see this flap being drawn forward that's the intention of this stitch in this uh, posterior commissure reconstruction operation so that you're taking the tension off of the distal attachments down here in the, um, in the patient's uh, larynx. And then you take the clip, a flyer. Now I'm gonna show you a problem with the clip flyer. So you might think, okay, that's not the thing to learn. Well, it is the thing to learn because you can see, even if you have a problem, in this case, I've, I've actually attached this, the uh, clip to some tissue, um, you can correct it. And if in correcting it, you've, you've rendered the suture too loose, well, then you can simply clip underneath that. Same way, just get underneath, clip it again. And, uh, and then at the end, after you've uh, laid your clips in good position, you can use the laser to cut the uh, excess suture material away. Um, I've been asked more times than I can count uh, what happens to these clips when they fall off? Of course, I made that point earlier that it matters not if they fall off. It's not an issue. Um, you can have two clips on a suture. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, the patient will cough them out and uh, eventually they will end up in the Ganges River or somewhere else um, uh, for the GI tract. So that said, if a clip is loose, you can simply squeeze it and uh, Again, to cut the suture material, you'll see the, uh, the laser is an excellent option. You can lay it against tissue, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can hold it in air. Uh, it can be, you can pretend you're in a, in a shooting range and you're aiming for a target. You, what you don't want to do is you don't want to leave a lot of excess suture material sticking out because that excess suture material is, is sensible by the patient and it's irritating. They feel like they have a, an insect in their airway and it's unpleasant. So this I would have uh, cut shorter um, also with the laser. Um, you, of course, you need to suck the plume away. Right now that this looks like a smoky scene there, um, but that's the concept. So 
I didn't mean that to go quite so fast. Oh, so in the context of um, vocal fold paralysis uh, with encroachment, um, this elegant operation that has been around for decades um, has numerous uh, 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 techniques. Uh, you can use uh, uh, Gore-Tex uh, mesh. You can uh, place all manner of different uh, crafted um, medialization devices. Uh, but you can't do any of these if the opposite side um, appears to be touching the um, the paralyzed cord. So these people are invariably said, uh, told that you you can't have anything to make your voice better because it will make your airway worse. If we make your airway better, your voice will be worse. So it's a zero sum game that is a very unpleasant conundrum both for the patient and for the surgeon. Uh, most people like this are offered a tracheostomy and that they will live with for the rest of their lives and then try to do something to improve the voice once you've got a superior airway below. So patients who have the uh, vocal fold paralysis with obstruction can be uh, well served by this approach, um, uh, which you may or may not have seen. Uh, this is patient one. So this is the patient that I saw um, in my uh, uh, practice uh, a very long time ago uh, and found her to have this voice. She, she wasn't actually that concerned about her voice, although it was raspy and she was aware of that fact. She'd had thyroidectomy some eight years earlier, I believe, she was much more concerned that she can't breathe, she cannot exert herself. So even though this is not a terrible voice, one of the better voices, you might say, her larynx actually looks like this. You can barely see the inside of her larynx. And when she takes a deep breath, all of this tissue prolapses in. And so I took her to the operating room to basically to do an operation in two stages. I was going to take away this obstructing tissue and uh, let me to turn that uh, volume down. Can you still hear me? I, I think you can it's just the voice of the voice server of this procedure. Um, if you can't, uh, please text me and I'll turn the whole sound back on. But what I'm doing basically is using the scanning laser to open up a flap of mucosa here overlying the prolapsing arytenoid tower. And I was going to basically amputate all this tissue, close the wound up, let her heal, and bring her back another day for medialization or even just an injection uh, laryngoplasty if there was enough room. Oftentimes, the, the cord itself that's paralyzed, in her case, this side, um, has come across so far in the midline that it's not just a prolapsing arytenoid top, a tower, it is an encroachment uh, through the um, entirety of the airway uh, at the level of the larynx. So here's the cartilage that uh, has become hypertrophic just out of its uh, um, malposition. It, it um, uh, for some reason changes in character when uh, post paralysis, it just seems to flop in the way. Um, the tissue on the opposite side of the larynx is quite normal in appearance, but this is this is a, certainly an excessive amount of cartilage. So I'm in, endeavoring to remove it and preserve the mucosa. As I got uh, further along in this point, you can see I'm using a one millimeter circle uh, with a scanning laser, and uh, there's basically no char. Um, I start realizing that this tissue that I'm about to remove could actually augment this cord well, as long as there was enough room between the two sides. That's why this procedure is called an, uh, um, a, um, augment a, a, it's, uh, I apologize here. Um, this is the forming of the uh, flap of tissue. Now, once I realized, okay, yes, I have a flap of tissue that I can produce, um, I'm now getting down uh, more distally. So this becomes the augmentation of the augmentation lateralization laryngoplasty. 
augmentation, lateralization, laryngoplasty. That tissue is implanted in the paraglottic space and uh, bulks and medializes the anterior and the lateralization stitch that is placed um, also within the wound through the thyroid lamina soft tissue. So the tissues that are overlying the thyroid lamina lateral to the cord are hooked with the suture. And then the arytenoid itself is brought laterally for the patients that actually have a full-on medialization of that arytenoid to both give you a better voice with a bulked cord and a better airway with a tilted out, just paramedian uh, arytenoid cartilage. So what you couldn't see into, uh, as far as the airway was concerned previously, you will be able to see in uh, postoperatively. So as this proceeds, um, I use the same techniques that you were seeing previously, except this is with proline suture. I'm actually holding the implant in place. Keep in mind, this is the first case of this technique being used. And um, I'm hooking it down there underneath the proline so that it stays in position. That's all part of the uh, ALL procedure, which by the way, was presented at the ALA uh, a few months ago. And um, uh, 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 as a common reaction, I was hearing from my colleagues, how come I don't see this up, uh, this condition? Um, if you don't see this condition, you're not looking for it because it exists. So now the graft is in position there. And then I put uh, clips on the, uh, on the sutures holding the graft in place, and I put clips in the sutures lateralizing the arytenoid for the patients who need that. This patient did not need as much lateralization as she needed this to be removed so she could breathe and then uh, give her uh, a better voice. And this is the clipping. Paul, we are not able to hear you. 
Paul, we are not able to hear you. You can see the slides, but not able to hear you. Okay, Dr. Paul, can you hear uh, us? Yeah, now yeah. it's better. Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah. Now, now we can, can hear you, sir. Yeah, it's normal now. Yeah. Now you can hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Okay. It might be when the sound of the of the of the um, of the uh, movie is on, you might not be able to hear me. So let's test that theory. So patient with. Left vocal fold paralysis and a good voice, but but encroachment. So basically. I found the Gore-Tex having migrated laterally and pushing the retinoid tower immediately. So I removed the Gore-Tex and I, um, I basically did what I did on the other, the other patient. Um, I harvested this tissue and placed it in the paraglottic space. And like the first patient, the retinoid wasn't particularly far distracted towards the opposite side. Um, since this, these first few cases, like the, uh, this one and the one before, um, the majority of patients that I found with this problem uh, that are symptomatic are symptomatic because the arytenoid itself is, is way past the midline. It's, it's adducted like um, a contracture of the cricoarytenoid joint can, uh, can cause. So it's in that context in particular that the lateralization is, is key. When the arytenoid, is, instead of being where it belongs, is, is not at the midline, but beyond the midline, where the vocal process itself is pointing towards the opposite cord, and the body of the arytenoid has contracted medially, that's the, that's the patient that needs a lateralization of the arytenoid, not just an augmentation of the cord, an augmentation, lateralization, laryngoplasty. So this is the, the tissue that I'm harvesting as the as the graft material, since I'm removing the Gore-Tex, um, dissecting down to where the Gore-Tex was, by the way, was extremely challenging and eventually got to it and uh, managed to take it out. I don't actually recommend placing Gore-Tex as a medialization um, uh, material transorally. One of my uh, dear colleagues and, and uh, former protege has developed a technique for doing this safely transorally. And uh, my hat's off to him. He's innovating as I uh, hoped he would. Um, and, um, and yes, there is a way to do this. I, I hope it was just at some time in the next uh, year or so. So now I'm, I'm uh, isolating this, this graft material here. You can see all of this is going to be passed into the paraglottic space to give that left cord some bulk. Again, I'm using a circle. Here's the graft. In these first few cases, I didn't pay attention to the vascular supply of this tissue. Um, I eventually started preserving the posterior lateral uh, blood vessels that feed this uh, this tissue and uh, have um, improved my results. Now you can see what's happening to the cord as I push this tissue in. Look how the cord is enlarging. You basically just stuff it in there <laughs> and then place a stitch to hold it down. And it's being pushed into a muscular bed, which is arguably one of the most ideal places to bring tissue uh, that is devitalized um, because it will quickly pick up a blood supply. Now you can see how 
close to symmetrical. The cords are beginning to look. You also can see in the position of the arytenoid and the area epiglottic fold will now be out of the way as well so that it's um, um, giving us both the improved breathing and the improved voice. So I've These instruments for stenosis and then pseudo bilateral paralysis indications. Uh, open ways with this, there are uh, transoral ways, and also we done transoral which is the benefit of the So, with that, I will say thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if we have a minute for questions or comments, I'll we'll be happy to. But thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Yes, there are a few questions, but uh, we'll be taking them at the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Suma Matthews. Uh, Dr. Matthews is uh, a professor and head of the unit at Christian you Medical College. Hello. Uh, Dr. Matthews uh, has been a recipient of a gold medal by the Association of Otolaryngologists of India in 1997. And has been and has been a recipient of, of the prestigious Dr. P. V. Cherian Prize uh, by the Tamil Nadu Dr. M. G. R. Medical University. Uh, she has more than 25 publications in uh, national and uh, international index journals. Uh, we welcome you, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm not able to share my screen. Okay, okay. Uh, Ma'am, you are on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Your screen is visible now. Good evening and uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity to present this uh, topic today. During the course of my talk, I will uh, talk briefly about the head and neck infections and its management, the airway challenges that we encounter, ways of securing the airway and the choice and care of an alternate airway. As we well know, the common cause of head and neck infections arise from the tonsils or it could be from the teeth how the salivary glands or the cervical nodes could also be the cause. Uh, trauma and retained foreign bodies could also lead to uh, head and neck infections as seen in these pictures. If these infections are not treated appropriately, they could extend to involve the facial planes leading to separation and collection of pus in these spaces which are around the head and neck region, which are actually potential spaces. Further progression could lead to life-threatening complications like upper airway obstruction, jugular vein thrombosis, keratin soda aneurysm or rupture, pleural empyema, descending mediastinitis or septic shock. So the cornerstone in the management of all these patients is securing the airway, providing efficient drainage, uh, 
administering antibiotics and improving the immunological status of the patient. CT scan contrast enhances the diagnostic uh, method of choice because it tells us what the areas are involved and we can plan the proper surgical approach. And if the patient is not improving, it can also help in the detection of progress. The ultrasound is a useful tool as it helps in the uh, diagnostic needle aspiration as well as therapeutic when the patient does not have an immediate airway of compromise. X-rays are used useful in odontogenic infections. Gallo et al. proposed a management algorithm based on the risk assessment. According to them, the patients with low risk could be managed at home while the intermediate and high risk patients had to be hospitalized and intravenous medications uh, started. The high risk group would need immediate surgical therapy. If pus is detected, drainage is the treatment of choice as we see in this, these uh, slides that I've uh, placed. And if required, drainage tubes introduced. WAC devices are now used for the head and neck uh, drainage wound sites because they help uh, rapid healing because of the negative pressure that is. The airway challenge that we face is because of the distorted airway anatomy, the limited mouth opening, the tissue edema and the limited cervical tissue mobility. Like in this picture, we know retropharyngeal abscess, the anatomy in the child is significantly distorted, the trachea is moved uh, forward. In this patient who had a retained foreign body developed as extensive anterior neck abscess, which spread on to the chest and to the supraclavicular region. The X-ray shows the trachea significantly shifted to the right because of the collection of pus deep to the sternocleidomastoid, the anterior and the posterior cervical neck spaces, which actually extended into the superior mediastinum. Mouth opening could be restricted in patients who have quincy. This particular patient had Ludwig's angina. We can see collection of pus involved involving the sublingual and the submandibular space. Tissue edema is another cause. This patient had a lingual abscess. The tongue has been raised because of the edema of the floor of the mouth, both adding to the compromised airway. Difficult tissue planes in active head and neck infections are seen in necrotizing fasciitis. Limited mobility of the cervical tissue will hamper securing the airway. And this particular patient had to have significantly ramping up to enable the anesthetist to visualize the airway. The rescue measures that are at ha available presently are the laryngeal mask airway, transtracheal jet ventilation, and thry. The laryngeal uh, mask airway can be introduced without muscle res uh, relaxants and at times can be used as a bridge during the fiber optic intubation. Transtracheal jet ventilation is uh, also used, but it should be. Uh, well, one should be aware that adequate time should be given for the egress, otherwise there could be significant barotrauma. Thrive is now uh, come into anesthetic practice after Patel and uh, team popularized it. And this increases the apneic ventilation while uh, the airway is uh, try, uh, as we try to secure the airway. The options before us securing the airway are awake intubation with a flexible bronchoscope, a cricothyrotomy, uh, a tracheostomy. The cricothyrotomy could be needle cricothyrotomy or surgical cricothyrotomy. The Brofield suggested the four-step cricothyrotomy technique, which required very few instruments, and they say it can be uh, done in less than a minute. Palpate the anatomical structures, stabilize the trachea, the stab incision through the cricothyroid membrane, and the traction with the tracheal hook and this followed by the tube insertion. However, if one is not careful, we could occasionally um, introduce the tube through the thyroid membrane. Once uh, the airway is stabilized, one should be, um, be careful to change it on to uh, the appropriate position. They say after about 72 hours, the cricothyrotomy should be converted to a regular tracheostomy. The awake intubation with a flexible uh, bronchoscope, there is an initial training period 
and they have a slow learning curve. And if not regularly used, they could become de-skilled. The limitations to the bronchoscopic intubation in these emergencies are if there is bleeding in the airway or there's uncontrolled secretions. Suction may not be that effective. And in these patients who have a lot of soft tissue edema, that could also add to the compression of the airway. While the endotracheal tube could catch the arachnoid or the epiglottic fold as the intubating uh, bronchoscope passes the glottis. Now coming to tracheostomy, one should choose the ideal tracheostomy tube as was referred to by our earlier speaker. The diameter should be so balanced that it does not damage the tracheal wall as well as provide adequate breathing. And we should ensure that the tube is not closer than a centimeter or two to the carina. In a study by Prasanna Kumar, they found that the Indian uh, tracheal diameter was a little smaller compared to the other studies that were done. And also one should keep in mind that in children, a small one millimeter de decrease in the diameter of the subglottis resulted in a 35% decrease in the diameter of the subglottis as well as a 60 degree, a 60 percentage, 60 percent decrease in the airflow. So one, when we intubate a child, one should ensure that we go one size smaller because to avoid further damage. So when we deal with deep seated trachea because of the infected neck, because of the edema and thickened tissue, sometimes normal length tubes may not be adequate. So to buy time endotracheal mm -hmm. tubes through the tracheostomy site can be temporarily used. Adjustable flange tubes are now available, which we can adjust according to the thickness of the tissue. Mm -hmm. Also, the use of the maturation sutures, especially in children, will ensure that the tube, there's no accidental decannulation in these children. And in the event that we do not get an adequate uh, tracheostomy tube, if we, if we have the choice of only a metal tracheostomy tube for the ventilation, it can be modified using the universal 15 mm endotracheal tube connector. Now coming to a few acute laryngeal pathologies that we may come across, epiglottitis was uh, initially seen very often mm -hmm. in children and the H influenza was a common cause. The child would be diagnosed by the tripod position. But nowadays, in the, following the HIB vaccination, it's primarily now seen in the adult population, along with H influenza, the other organisms like staph uh, pneumonia, pyogenes are seen. And the common symptoms that they present is change in voice or dinophagia. One should be uh, aware that red flag signs like striders, subjective shortness of breath and rapid onsense, onset of symptoms herald uh, crisis and we should be ensure that we admit these patients. The patients are diagnosed with a flexible laryngoscopy and if time permits, a lateral x-ray neck. The algorithm proposed by Gardinelli is that these patients who have a respiratory distress should have their airway secured. If we are in the ER, it's the emergency uh, room physician along with the anesthetist mm -hmm. and the otolaryngologist stand by in case there is a necessity for cricothyrotomy in the, in the event of a failed intubation. The other patients could be uh, should be admitted and preferably observed in the ICU. If they improve, they, uh, there could be a step down. If they progress, one should move on to securing their way, intubating, and if that fails, a cricothyrotomy. Acute laryngotracheal bronchitis is commonly seen in children, uh, younger, the younger age group, and most of them can be managed conservatively. Only 3% of them would need uh, an intubation. Reassurance is of vital importance both to the parent and of the child. Diphtheria is another acute infection that we uh, occasionally see. It could be because of the membrane over the tonsils, or it could be because it moves on, the infection moves on to the to involve the lar laryngeal inlet. Intubation can be achieved in these patients with uh, trying to remove the membrane that has occurred uh, seen over the larynx. Now, 
coming to the choice of the airway um, alternative, whether it's an endotracheal tube or a tracheostomy, it will depend upon whether we have we are in a situation where we have an ICU setting. Uh, if we have an ICU setting, endotracheal tube, the patient can be an, uh, undergo an intubation. However, there, there may be uh, so occasions where they may require multiple intubations because of the tube block or in the event of a failed extubation. This is not seen if tracheostomy is used. And in these acute laryngeal problems, the endotracheal tube move, uh, tra traverses through an inflamed area while a tracheostomy will bypass it. It's uh, less expensive the tubes compared to the tracheostomy tubes and many children will need to be sedated and the feeding has to be through NG tube if it's an endotracheal uh, tube intubation. Skillful nursing is required. And as we know, they cannot speak. So depending upon the situation, we decide uh, which is the better alternate airway that we have to choose. So to conclude, head and neck infections continue to pose challenges to us. The airway management will depend upon the clinician's experience, whether he's a surgeon or a non-surgeon and also on the patient characteristics. I'd like to acknowledge my teachers, my mentors, colleagues, trainees, and my patients. Thank you for a patient listen. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, the question and answer section. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, sir, will uh, take up all the questions. Yeah. Over to you, Gandhi, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Suma, Dr. Paul, uh, Dr. Al Yakchi, uh, for your valuable contribution and sparing time for uh, our pleasure. Thank, thank, thank you very much. From, uh, it's our uh, pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I'm very happy to say more than 600 participants are there on um, internet listening to our talks and again question answer sessions. A lot of questions have come up. Uh, I would just ask few of them, uh, so there should not be any repetition, and uh, basic should be uh, answered. Uh, Aliyachi, how much uh, stenotic length required for tracheal dissection? So maybe uh, for it, it depends. It depends a lot on the height of the patient. So in an average height patient, you can resect up to four centimeter without release maneuvers. If you have that, that, that will be roughly the limit. If you need to resect, you can resect up to 50% of the trachea length, but you need to do some release. So we work, if we have a long segment, we work with our cardiothoracic colleagues who they will come and do lateral thoracotomy and release of the um, lingual um, ligament, the lung ligament and pericardium. Um, and then you can do suprahyoid release, although that can have significant impact on the swallowing. So if you are gonna do suprahyoid release, you need the patient to be young, healthy, with normal swallowing function. Yeah, and are there any guidelines uh, to decide the maximum length? Yeah, so we, uh, as, as I said, if you do all your release um, techniques, you can resect up to 50%. That will depend on the uh, age of the patient. So in pediatric, for example, you can almost take carina all the way to the neck. In adult, you will have less flexibility. So you, you just, I don't think there is like a specific guideline, but in general, you can resect up to four centimeter, yeah. you know, or up to six if you do release maneuvers as well. Uh, again, another question for you. How to calculate the ideal size of modmerary T tube uh, in cases of laryngotracheal stenosis? As a treatment, um, as a post-operative measure? Well, it, it depends. Again, it depends on the gender and the uh, height of the patient. So proportionally, men are taller than women. So men will take size 14 tube. Women of average height will take size 12 tube. Uh, if you have a shorter female, shorter male, people with congenital, um, congenitally, you know, congenital condition, narrow tracheas, you can go like size 10. But in average, size 12 for women, size 14 for men of an average height. Yeah. So I think size uh, 10 to 12, maybe for Indian population. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and one thing uh, I want to just add, 
you should be minimum three millimeters away from the stenotic uh, lesion. So above and below, you should be in terms of resection. Yeah. Yes, you need you need to get to a healthy healthy tracheal tissue okay. because okay. if you go into fibrosis. That that's gonna you, you know you're stitching scar tissue and it's gonna scar again. So you need healthy mucosa, healthy cartilage on both sides. Yeah. So you need to factor that as well. Uh, Paul, uh, are is there any role of routine bronchoscopy in all ICU patients after extubation? I mean, what information we get with the bronchoscopy? Um, certainly, there's a, a role. Uh, the uh, value in particular when we do it the, using the otolaryngology technique, which is to use a laryngeal gargle of uh, lidocaine, uh, which in 90% of patients would get them very numb, uh, is that, excuse me, you have a cooperative patient that can do respiratory maneuvers for you uh, on command. Uh, there's There are a lot of people who have excessive dynamic airway collapse um, or membranous uh, tracheobronchomalacia. Uh, it's controversy as to the name, uh, but you can't diagnose that condition unless you have a cooperative patient to be able to fully exhale, inhale deeply, exhale rapidly, or cough on command, not just cough reflexively. Um, if you make that diagnosis, that disease is curable. And, uh, but you know, you won't know if you don't see. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, another indication may be uh, this is tracheomalacia or what uh, Paul has emphasized. Uh, if there are any granulations because of the trauma due to endotracheal tube or a tracheostomy tube, then better to be known about the granulations because they can fibrose afterwards. Maybe arytenoid granulomas, if they are quite big, then uh, you can prevent their further fibrosis with local injection of steroids and just a follow up with bronchoscopy. I think granulations due to trauma of endotracheal tube or a tracheostomy, and again loss of uh, uh, malleability of the, the cartilages going into tracheomalacia. That Paul uh, always talked about. Uh, uh, Madam, uh, I mean this is not related, but uh, any findings? Uh, what would be the endoscopic finding of patients with a reflux disease? This question has come actually. Uh, the Patients with reflux disease could have uh, red, um, red uh, larynx, but the subtle signs that we see are heaping up of tissue between the interarachnoid or post uh, posterior glottic area. There could be something like a pseudo uh, sulcus where there is subglottic edema and uh, uh, arachnoid edema or arachnoid con congestion are some of the usual findings that we see in patients with uh, reflux. Yeah, there are uh, interretinoid bands and congestion for the arachnoids, subglottic edema, as Madam has said. Yeah, thank you, Madam. Thank you. Uh, I mean, this seems to be a question for me. Uh, what is the reason for seizuring of arachnoids in a patient with normal larynx? Uh, the normal larynx, actually, we don't have any uh, reason to actually cut over the arachnoids. In the sense, uh, in the cases of functional uh, bilateral apparatus parasite or palsy or a functional obstruction, I don't know. This would be the one of the extreme uh, step which you, when uh, you can move ahead. Other than that, I don't think there is any other reason for uh, the arytenoid. If I if I may, Sachin, I, I I believe these patients have a have a paralysis or a paresis at some point yeah. that recovered by the arytenoid position. I, I agree with Paul that arytenoid prolapse going across, impeding the other side, is something I do recognize and I do manage. So before I inject, I address that supraglottic exactly as as um, Paul was saying, and yeah. I, and I think generally vocal cord paresis is an underdiagnosed condition that most people will miss and it's sometimes a subtle sign that you need to look for position of the uh, you know the compensatory squeeze from the supraglottis etc so the scissoring of the arytenoid is possibly related to that yeah absolutely agreed 
Yeah, and uh, and then one question for Paul: uh, Thyroplasty type one, while shipping the silicone implant, what is the what should be the depth that should be created? Well, um, when I did the the open version of uh, thyroplasty type one, um, I uh, I took great pains to both um, palpate uh, through the thyrotomy uh, the tissue that I was medializing while looking at a, a tiny, usually a tiny image of the larynx in an awake patient. Um, the implants that I use now using a transoral technique um, are between eight and 10 millimeters deep, um, but that is delivered to the arytenoid. So it medializes the arytenoid in the form of an arytenoid adduction, as well as the true cord. Probably when you're only medializing the uh, the true cord through the open approach, you would uh, you would use significantly uh, less depth in most patients. A large man obviously would need um, um, more displacement because the larynx itself is larger. Um, the uh, the technique for doing it transorally is uh, is now in print, uh, and I recommend anyone uh, who's uh, facile with uh, transoral suturing. Uh, look at that technique. It's it's so much easier to to, to do than uh, than an awake uh, uh, Ishiki. Even Ishiki himself, uh, when I presented this at his voice conference, uh, one of the last, I think, the last conference that he held uh, in uh, uh, in Japan, uh, he acknowledged uh, this was a, a better approach. I was very blessed to get his blessing um, uh, that this was the the new way to do uh, thyroplasty type one. Uh, I really, I want to uh, thank you all uh, for the uh, time you have spared for uh, this uh, webinar, this uh, airway module, and I'm very happy we have worked around, uh, as I said, already said, um, more than 4,500 uh, 4, registrations from around 48 countries. And lively, there are around 1,000 which are there online. Others, uh, I would request these talks would be available with the link which we have already provided with all registered candidates. You can go back and uh, take over the uh, lectures. As we have finished with our airway module, all the certificates would be issued as soon as the delegates, they will go and attend the quiz, which will be available on the link, which we have already presented. Once they complete the quiz, uh, they will be awarded the airway module participation certificate. Uh, I would like to thank again, before we close, actually just for inform, informing uh, all the delegates, I would, uh, there is a fellowship which we conduct at Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital. Uh, uh, this fellowship is uh, accredited by Royal College of Surgeons of England. And uh, this is for 12 months. Anybody is fellowship will start from 1st of April 2023 and will run for uh, 12 months. Anyone who is interested can log on to our website www.voicelaser.com or email us, contact us, and then we'll know how to apply and attend the fellowship program. Uh, I would like to thank all of you again and the faculty members will again engage in our further uh, modules, conferences, web series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sassini. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you.